Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over to Chronix with Namit Varma. He's going to talk today about how to integrate an embedded FPGA and how to meet timing. Namit, what sort of issues do you encounter as you try and integrate an embedded FPGA? Timing is obviously a complex uh, issue as you get into an SOC, uh, but it becomes more complex as you start de integrating different types of components too, right? Yes. So an, an embedded FPGA is not like your typical SOC IP. Uh, there are specific timing scenarios that it supports that are something that ASIC integrators may not be necessarily used to. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So what are we looking at here? So Ed, um, what I've drawn is a kind of a very basic view of an embedded FPGA. Um, what we have over here is the embedded FPGA as the whole. Uh, on the left-hand bottom side here is the FCU, uh, which is the FPGA configuration unit. And then what I have over here is the fabric, which is the actual programmable logic. Uh, this is divided into essentially four clusters, as we call them, uh, and a central clock trunk. Uh, so what I'm going to first of all describe is how the clocking occurs in an em embedded FPGA, especially in reference to what is external to the embedded FPGA. Uh, so first and foremost, you have clocks that feed into the FPGA from the north and from the south. Uh, these clocks are used to distribute and use within the programmable logic. And they may also be uh, output from each of these clusters on the north and south side, as I've shown over here. Uh, similarly, each of these clusters also has clock inputs uh, on each side, on, in this case on the uh, west and the south over here on the west and the north, and so on. Uh, to get the terminology correct, all of these clocks are called boundary clocks, and the ones here feeding into the trunk is called the trunk clock. How do these integrate with the other clocks in an SOC? OK, so there are two ways in which this may happen. Um, the first, first method would be uh, where the SOC provides a clock into the trunk with the primary intent of that clock being used internally only in the programmable F, uh, F, EFPGA. So uh, for example, if you have a piece of logic that's uh, running off a clock and that is otherwise asynchronously connected to the rest of it, then that clock simply feeds into the trunk, goes to that logic, and is otherwise unused outside. Uh, and then you may also have a couple of scenarios where the clock is shared between logic in the SOC and in the embedded FPGA. And in that case, what you want to do is you want to route that clock in either from the trunk or from the boundary or both. And that gives you different kind of different timing scenarios and different ways in which you can meet timing across the boundary. Where do people typically run into problems as they start integrating the different clocks? So people would have to think about two things when they're integrating a clock into an embedded FPGA. One is how many clocks do they need inside for the logic that they're going to actually program onto the FPGA. And the second thing they need to think about is, what are they interfacing to the embedded FPGA? And how many clocks? And what kind of clocking do they want there? So let me take a couple of examples. Uh, let's say I have a SERDIS over here. And this SERDIS has a PLL inside it, which generates a clock. Um, now this clock needs to be provided to the embedded FPGA. And then that needs to be used at the interface between the SERDIS and the embedded FPGA. In this case, if you were to route that clock in through the trunk, that would probably be insufficient to meet timing, simply because a trunk clock normally has a pretty large insertion delay, and that would make it difficult to meet at a high frequency across this interface. So what you would need to decide is whether you want to route that clock in through the boundary, or through the trunk, or both. So these are the kind of problems that a ASIC integrator needs to consider when they're talking about, or when they're thinking about how to integrate and how to route clocks into the embedded FPGA. So what are the different clocking scenarios that you possibly can run into here? Okay, so let's talk about the two clocking scenarios that we have. The first is the trunk clock, the trunk clocking scenario with respect to an interface. So what you would have is a clock that enters into the uh, fabric over here. It gets routed through this fabric and finally comes out uh, through this point at the boundary clock. The same clock gets used internally uh, in all the registers in the embedded FPGA. And this clock then goes out to some SOC component as well. 
So what you have is a timing scenario uh, across this interface. And you would have registers over here, you would have registers over here, or in the interface cluster over here, and you need to make timing across this. So the main consideration here is to route this clock up to these flops. Ensure that the routing latencies are minimal enough that you can meet this timing at the interface. So that would be one potential timing scenario. The other one that I'll draw on the south over here is if I have similarly an SOC IP or SOC block over here. And in this case, the clock gets routed in from the SOC. It gets routed to registers over here in the fabric and in the interface clusters. And so I have a register here. I have potentially have a register here and a register over here. Uh, in this case, the timing that would need to be met by the uh, ASIC integrator is between these two registers or these two registers over here. And that would again need to be done in a way where latencies to this register and latencies to the registers inside the speed core are well managed. So typically when you're working with an embedded FPGA, you're pretty much at the front end of Moore's law. You're dealing with some of the most advanced nodes. You've got issues like variation in there. How does that affect the clocks? Right, so that's a good question. Um, so th that's exactly where choice of clocking has to be made up front. So for example, if I look at this particular clocking scenario, uh, the clock divergence point is over here. Uh, and the divergence of the clock from here to the interface clusters and here to the register in the SOC will typically tend to be small, uh, probably about 500 to a, a PS to a nanosecond. So in that case, you know, given these technology nodes and given the amount of variation, uh, it would be quite reasonable to meet uh, frequencies in the range of 500 megahertz to you know, maybe even up to a gigahertz at this interface. But if instead I were to route the clock through the trunk, uh, and send it to this register over here, and then also route the clock externally to, this, to the SOC register over here, I would be dealing with a much larger clock divergence, and hence a much more difficult task of meeting timing across this interface. How do you make sure you've got it right? How do you test this? We provide a set of dot libs along with uh, the deliverables. Uh, those dot libs basically come in two different flavors, if you like. Uh, one is what we call simple timing mode, which is where we assume that you are going to add a register and use it in the interface cluster. The other one is an advanced timing mode lib, where we assume that, the, that you will bypass the interface cluster and go directly into the fabric itself. Uh, all of these scenarios are supported by those timing libs that we provide. And so depending on which lib you plug in, uh, an ASIC integrator can run static timing analysis with that particular library and meet timing across the interface. If you're working in a classic ASIC uh, SOC, you're going to be running into these clock issues already. Does the embedded FPGA add any different things that you wouldn't already be used to? So the embedded FPGA doesn't really add any new complexities. Uh, what I would say is um, it adds, it provides you with different clocking scenarios. And occasionally what that might do for an ASIC integrator is it might it might add a level of complexity of choosing one scenario versus another. Uh, a normal standard IP that you get would have support for just one possible clocking scenario. So you use that, you meet timing with that, and that's pretty much the end of it. But over here, the designer needs to understand the different clocking scenarios first, make appropriate choices about which scenario to use for which particular interface, uh, and as long as they do that in a reasonable way, the rest of it really works just like any other IP. Can you explain a little bit about the interface clusters, how they're used, and how that affects timing? Sure. Uh, so the interface clusters are basically a means uh, to minimize the, uh, the timing integration between the ASIC and the FPGA world. Uh, and so what we do is, in the interface clusters, we have dedicated registers that you can route to. And once you do that, uh, then all the timing analysis at the ASIC level gets concluded in the ASIC STA. And then all the timing that happens internally, which is basically the user design timing, is, is relegated only to ACE, and the ASIC integrator doesn't have to meet any special requirements there. However, the uh, interface cluster has a basic disadvantage, 
which is that it adds an additional pipeline stage to your logic. And occasionally someone may not want that pipeline stage. And so you can bypass this register and go directly into the fabric. However, when you look at that kind of timing interface, the basic problem that you're dealing with is you don't quite know what the delays within the fabric are. The reality is that those delays depend on the user design and the implementation of that user design by tools like ACE. And so what we do is when you use this timing mode, which we call advanced timing mode, uh, we give you a budgeted lib of this particular, uh, of, the, of the embedded FPGA. And when we give you a budgeted lib, you can use that to meet your timing across this interface. And what it does is it gives you a high probability of meeting timing when you run ACE and you have certain logic and certain depth in the path within the embedded FPGA. So if you have a budgeted lib, what, how do you know that's actually good? Okay, so the, the flow that we recommend to customers is basically the following. We ask them to use the budgeted lib and we ask them to meet timing across this interface. Once they've done that, we provide them with an internal tool, uh, which we call STC Timer. And STC Timer basically runs in the uh, customer's ASIC STA tool and basically extracts all the IO site timing of the embedded FPGA. We then feed this into ACE, and then the customer can take a set of potential user designs, you, uh, use those Sorry. along with this timing that they have uh, obtained out of SDC timer, and then check whether they can still, still meet timing or not. Uh, you know, one of the scenarios could be that they realize that some of the uh, pins are under constraint and potentially are the reason why you're not able to meet timing. In that case, you can go back, change the budgets on these libs accordingly, and basically make them tighter, and then use that to meet timing. So you can go through a few iterations of uh, using a budgeted lib, going to SDC timer, going to ACE, getting timing feedback from that, and optimizing your dot lib with that. Namit Varma, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.